calling attention to all these so-called cultural centers london paris berlin yeah all of you the ancestors called yeah they have a message for you they want their stuff back <laughs> guys welcome back to my channel today is a special video i'm wearing my traditional clothes you know representing nigeria i'd like to give a special shout out to the african history project this is where i source most of my information in fact they are what inspired me to create this video especially apeke omolu please check them out they're amazing they provide free lectures about african history and it's honestly amazing they're doing the lord's work honestly I'd also like to say I did put a lot of research into this video, so I would greatly appreciate if you were to like this video. It would really help with the algorithm and with getting this video a bit more exposure and to get more people to check this video out. In the last couple of years, with the uprise of all these social justice issues, it's had to bring a lot of conversations into the forefront, including these supposedly forward-thinking cultural hubs. They've been essentially forced to address the elephant in the room, which is that they're holding on to high hundreds if not thousands of very sacred African artifacts that are worth millions. In recent years Germany, France, Scotland and England have offered to return some of the African artifacts that they stole. As you know they're kind of understanding that it's, it's not really a good look, it's not a good look in 2021. It's kind of getting harder to justify holding on to stolen property, you know. I think they paid a fair price. Or did they take it like they took everything else? It's reported that the British Museum holds on to about 60,000 African pieces, whereas in France it's reported to be about 90,000 African pieces. France, <laughs> they got ahead of Britain in that one. It's great that they want to return some of these artifacts, but you know, 2020 happened and with that, came some new developments including a global financial crisis you can imagine all these cultural institutions that rely on the public and rely on funding have been greatly affected by the panoramic and they need to make up some money and how they're going to do that by selling their stolen african goods yes that's right there's a new market for stolen african artifacts <laughs> auction houses like christie's yes we're naming and shaming on this channel are selling african artifacts valued between 30,000 to 900,000 euros yeah mm -hmm. another auction house sotheby's sotheby's i'm not sure uh they're selling the famous climbing fang head which is from present day gabon described as the very summit of african creativity that's being sold for a cool 2.5 to 4 million dollars and that's just a conservative estimate it could, it could sell for more you know i don't think people really realize to the extent at which you know africa's been effed over to put it nicely i'll name a few very important pieces which have been put in the limelight so there's the Savo Lions. So the Savo Lions were shot dead by British engineer, Lieutenant Colonel John Patterson. The Kenyan National Museum, yeah, they want it back. They want them back. The Bangwa Queen, one of the most famous pieces of African art, has huge sacred significance for Cameroonians, representing the power and health of the Bangwa people. This was looted by Germans and passed around various colonizers until it ended up in France. The traditional leaders of the Bangwa want it back. There's the Magdala treasures from modern day Ethiopia. They include the 18th century gold crown and wedding dress taken from Ethiopia by the British army. It's currently housed in the V&A Museum. Ethiopia actually lodged a claim back in 2007 and V&A have offered to loan these items back to them. Yeah, loan, loan. Don't want people to miss that word. So while there are many pieces from many African countries that have been stolen, today I want to focus on probably the most prominent looting, which was the punitive expedition of Benin in 1897. I'm going to give y'all a little geography lesson. So the Benin Kingdom is not to be confused with the modern day country Benin, but the Benin Kingdom can be found in what is present day southern Nigeria. The Benin Kingdom was a mighty dominant force within Africa like they had a military that was a force to be reckoned with they were recognized globally yes they traded with not only their African neighbors but they traded with Europeans they traded way before the slave trade came into existence they were an independent community they were a slave owning community you know can't gloss by that didn't say they weren't flawed 
And in 1888, Oba of Ramwen came to the throne. So for those who don't know, the Oba is the king of that nation. So Oba of Ramwen was basically the king of the Benin Kingdom at the time. So as I mentioned earlier, but the Benin Kingdom was very prominent within the trading industry in Africa. The Oba had absolute power. So he had so much power over his people. If he was to command that the markets or the trade will be closed, just by his word alone, he didn't have to enforce it with the military or anything, just by his word, then they would close. He collected taxes of his people. He also collected custom taxes of Europeans that they would trade with. The Europeans didn't like this. They didn't like that the Oba had so much power that he could just say, today I don't want the markets to be open and their trade would be closed and that would greatly affect the Europeans and their trade. So something had to be done. They had to acquire more power, they had to acquire more land and they had to find a way to infiltrate the, the, the Benin Kingdom. It was a massive threat to them. And they found a way, of course. The Oba didn't want free trade. He very much liked the power that he had, understandably. <laughs> and the British did this by coming up with this supposed treaty. So the British consul, which was in, I believe, southern Nigeria at the time, um, in 1892 actually said, trade, commerce and civilization are paralyzed by the form of fetish government, which unfortunately prevails throughout the kingdom. I hope before long to be able to put a stop to this state of affairs. So this lets you know that the rule of the Oba was so strong, was so solid that the British consul referred to it as a fetish government. Those are very strong words, very strong words. Okay, clearly had an issue. The respect of the Oba was held both by culture and religion. So when you mix in culture and religion, it can be very strong. And the Oba was seen as very much like a godlike figure, similar to today, similar to, you know, English kings and queens of the past, held to such a high ranking, they were seen as almost divine and godlike. It took a long time for the British to actually even uh, have an audience with the Oba. They tried many, many times. Lieutenant Phillips and some of his officers went over to Benin without asking for permission and of course they were massacred, they were killed. And this drove the British crazy, they did not like that. So this was the beginning of their campaign to smear the Benin Kingdom, to legitimise their claim to infiltrate and invade Benin Kingdom. So what happened was there was a lot of propaganda to portray the Benin Kingdom as a land of savages, that the killings of Lieutenant Phillips was some sort of some sort of cannibalistic human ritual. You know, a lot of things like that that would just make people think, yeah, these people are savages. So the British devised a treaty. Now the Oba was so unbothered by this treaty, he refused to touch the pen. So he did not sign the treaty himself, but he did give permission for his advisors to sign the treaty. And they signed his name with an X, like literally just an X. So in the lands of the Obas, it's very much taken as your word is your creed. So things are agreed upon by your word. Your words are taken very seriously. You cannot go back on your word. Pieces of paper and things like that were not you know that is a western sort of concept so he thought just because he his hand did not sign the paper you know he had nothing to do with it he didn't say himself that he was signing anything that he agreed with anything he didn't read it as well the treaty was poorly translated from english into their language so you know the whole thing was just a sham i do think that oba should have taking it more seriously, but this is hindsight speaking in 2021. So what followed from that is the treaty, of course, relinquished the Oba's rights to his own lands. He had no sovereignty over his land. He had no say in the trade and the markets. Essentially, you know, the British didn't have to pay taxes anymore. And he was no longer, essentially he wasn't ruling over his kingdom. Now, of course, this piece of paper meant nothing to the Oba's of the land, but it meant something to the British. So in the eyes of the British law, this gave them justification to do what they were about to do next. This legitimized their crimes. In 1897, this is when the British came and invaded Benin. Benin was a mighty kingdom. They were a city to be reckoned with. They had a great wall that was actually longer than the Great Wall of China until now, you know, the British came and ruined it and knocked most of it down. They looted thousands and thousands of African artifacts. Many of these items were cast out of ivory, wood, ceramics, gold, 
and they were cast for the ancestral altars of past kings and queens and queen mothers so you will see the uh, the benin bronzes that they're, they're literally like the heads of past kings and queens and they took all of it they took all of it they took loads of ivory i mean you know you name it they took it believe it or not they they tried to portray it as a sort of altruistic sort of motive that they were coming in to protect these pieces but no they took it not only to devalue the kingdom but to also they knew the strength that there was in having these cultural pieces they knew the value of these things even within the, the year 1897 when they stole these items they actually auctioned them off initially they went to the secretary of state of foreign affairs um, in the uk and then eventually they were sold off to different uh, cultural centers within the UK and abroad and then sold to private collectors as well where they remain to this day I could go a bit more in depth but just for the sake of keeping this video not too long that is essentially the basis of what happened in 1897 now fast forward to the 21st century why is it important that we now return these artifacts I mean you know I could just say the simple basis because it's the right thing to do but of course that's just not uh that's not enough justification for for these things to happen of course these things are worth millions and millions of dollars they knew that back then there is this saying to possess items of history is to have history itself so by having these historic artifacts you are robbing Africa of its own history its people are robbed of its own history of its own cultural heritage it's already enough that they were colonized by all these European powers they were stripped of their culture stripped of their history and they've also been stripped of their cultural pieces so these foreign cultural hubs like I said Said London, Berlin, Paris, Milan, all these other places are enriched by these African pieces. By holding onto these pieces, you're further impoverishing and damaging the infrastructure and the historic integrity of the continent. A prominent German philosopher by the name of Heigl, Heigl said that the African way of life was a negation to history and they were a cultural denigration. But Germany has how many Nigerian pieces? <laughs> German mathematician Frobenius couldn't believe that 12th to 15th century brass heads of the affair were of African origin. In fact, he speculated that they were from the work of ancient Greeks in the lost city of Atlantis. So <laughs> even back then, people were hesitant to believe that Africans were capable of creating such amazing artwork that they thought it was even from a whole fictional land. Boy, let me calm down. To hold these cultural pieces is excluding Africans from their own history. So, you know, these items are able to be studied on, to have pieces written on them by Europeans. Africans cannot even write their own studies, their own pieces, their own books on these cultural pieces unless they go over to these European countries and thus further enriching these Europeans. It's a continuous cycle, you know, colonization has not ended. It's still continuing in these insidious ways. You know, if these European countries truly, truly cared about equality and from moving past from their ugly past, you know, Pretty Patel goes on about, you know, moving past transgressions and things like that. Okay, cool. Why do you need to have these African pieces since it's not yours? You want to move on from the past, give them back simple as that what i find to be also very interesting is in 1995 in new york city there was something called the spoils of war symposium so the spoils of war world war ii and its aftermath the loss reappearance and recovery of cultural property was an international symposium held in new york city to discuss the artworks cultural property and historic sites damaged lost and plundered as a result of world world war ii so they knew back then after how many decades of world war ii the significance of these cultural pieces to Germany, to the fact that they had a whole symposium where they were going to discuss how they were going to return these artifacts and return all these pieces and even restore some of these lost cultural pieces. But they can't do the same for Africa. It's such a big issue. There's so many protocols and things that are in the way that they just, you know, it's just so hard. They can't do it. Poor people. It really begs the question, you know, is Africa really respected in the world as a global power? Spoiler alert, no. Nigeria in particular has been petitioning to return these artifacts since their independence. Since 1960, they have been asking for these pieces to come back. As I mentioned earlier, some countries and museums are returning some of the, these goods. And you know, that's all well and good, but um, it's not quite what you think. They're either being returned on loan or they have several conditions attached to them. So a good example of this is the 2018 Benin Dialogue Group deal. 
So in 2018, there was a group called the Benin Dialogue Group, which is formed of representatives of several European museums, the Royal Court of Benin, Edo State Government, and Nigeria's National Commission for Museums and Monuments. So all these entities came together to strike a deal, which basically secured some of the most prominent items from the Benin Kingdom to be returned to Benin to be housed in the Royal Benin Museum on loan. So they will be in this new museum, which will be opposite the palace of the Benin Kingdom, where they were originally looted, and they will be housed there on a temporary basis. You know, I low-key hope that they just keep them and return them. I'm sorry, like, why should they abide by these laws when they were double-crossed how many years ago? Like, they should just do the same back to them. A spokesperson for the British Museum said, European museums will play an active role in developing an elite institution suitable for housing exhibits that are considered to be among the greatest ever African artworks. But even with returning these artworks to Africa, the European, European museums and governments have also got their crusty hands into these African museums. They want their say, they want to know how they're housed, how they're being kept. So who do they have to justify this to? No one but themselves. So either they have them on loan or they're just only returning a few items. The French president Macron actually said, you know, he, he knows the significance of these items and said that, you know, we should return these items, like da 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 da. But they're only returning 26 out of 90,000 artifacts. 26 that is shameful they should be ashamed of themselves it's also worth mentioning that some private collectors have gone out of their way to return some artifacts there was a british guy his name's mark walker who actually voluntarily returned a set of benin bronzes that were captured by his grandfather so well done to him it is possible to be an ally and not expect monetary gain from your past crimes and with returning these artifacts also begs the question of okay where will they be housed so i mentioned the royal benin museum a lot of people seem to think that there aren't any museums in africa apart from egypt um there is just to let you know in senegal there's the museum of black civilization just the sound of that i would really love to go there one day so that's on my bucket list in lagos there is the yemisi shailon museum of art so he's actually a prince in lagos and he himself has questioned some concern over whether it's actually right to bring these pieces back to africa i think interestingly he brought up the fact that there are some opinions that these pieces shouldn't be returned to Africa because a lot of these pieces, thanks to colonialism, have been demonized. So along with looting, they also managed to, you know, implant this belief that traditional African beliefs are demonic and evil. So that these pieces, which, you know, a lot of them have a very religious or spiritual um, significance to a lot of older African communities. So a lot of people believe that they are demonic and they'd rather just not have anything to do with them, which is just part of the brainwashing. Like, the, oh, wow, the Europeans really did a number on Africa. Like you really, they really stripped them of their history and the, their cultural integrity. And I really think it's a shame that we're at this point where we, and we're questioning whether they should accept what is rightfully theirs. So what Prince Yemisi is actually proposed in as an alternative is to somehow gain ownership of these collections and these pieces and to then collect royalties from the cultural institutions that then house them, um, which is a good idea. I think that could work for some pieces, but you know, I think a lot of them should be returned. And if they're not returned, like his idea, pay them their money. Talk about reparations. So there you have it. That is the end of this video. Um, it was a very lengthy one, honestly, I was very, wordy kind of one i hope you stuck through if you got to the end of the video well done thank you uh please leave a comment and let me know your thoughts on this subject 